Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the ASCII virtual um, webinar on foreign direct investment experiences lessons for Cuba. We have a very, we have an excellent lineup of speakers this morning, um, and we're very happy to have you join us. But before we get started, uh, let me uh, introduce um, the, the president of ASCII, Gary uh, Myberduk. Um, he is a PhD, he has a PhD in economics, and during his 32-year career in the Foreign Service, he earned numerous awards for his economic and political analysis. His career includes serving as the director of the Office of Central American Affairs, counselor for economic political affairs in Havana, and professor of Nas national security strategy at the Army War College. He's written numerous articles about Cuba, about the Cuban economy, Q US Cuba policy, and the issues presented by future Cuba transition. He's the president of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy that is sponsoring this uh, webinar along with Columbia Law School Cuba Capacity Building Project. Let me turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Natalia. I'll keep my section short. I just want to introduce people who have not dealt with ASCII before to introduce ASCII. ASCII is now in its 31st year of anal analyzing uh, the Cuban economic situation, Cuban politics, and uh, trying to prognosticate the future, which tends to be rather difficult. Um, We would hope that people will consider joining ASCII. ASCII has, this is I think our sixth webinar this year so far um, on a wide variety of topics from the reform efforts to, um, to COVID um, and now to foreign direct investment. And um, in August, we'll be having our uh, next annual convention. I'm not quite sure if it's gonna be virtual or live yet. Um, logistic difficulties seem to keep coming up, um, but it will be two and a half to three days of great presentations on virtually every aspect of, of the Cuban economy and other parts of the Cuban society. Uh, with that introduction in mind, we have a website at ASCII, ASCII, Cuba.org, where you can uh, join up, where you can uh, sign up for our uh, conferences in the future. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna return it back to Natalia. Natalia, by the way, first presented this project to us uh, several months ago. She's made an enormous effort to get it together and get high quality speakers. And um, I'm gonna be delighted to, to, to watch and listen. Natalia, by the way, is, um, uh, has a legal and business career, which included acting as a senior executive of a public company, a board member of one of the largest transit systems in the world, and a partner of, nationally, of a nationally recognized law firm. During her 22 years in the private practice of law, she concentrated on, on corporate and securities law. She now directs the Cuban Capacity Building Project at Columbia Law School initiative designed to foster the development of the legal institutions necessary for Cuba to translate to a more market-based economy. Natalia is also a board member of ASCII and it's been great to get to know her and learn from her. With that, I'm gonna return it to Natalia and I'm gonna fade into the background. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gary. I should mention that I'm gonna introduce each speaker right before the speaker speaks. We ask that you submit your questions in writing and then we will take questions at the end after all the presentations. Um, so with that, let me introduce our first speaker, our keynote speaker, who's Carl Savant. He's an adjunct professor of, at Columbia Law School and he's a resident senior fellow at the Columbia Center on Sustainable um, Investment, the predecessor institute of which he founded. Until July 2005, he was director of the UNCTAD's investment division, uh, where he created the annual World Investment Report, which many of us use, of which he was his lead author. He was the lead author until 2004. He's an AIB fellow and an EIBA honorary fellow. And he's written a great deal on sustainable investment and his authority on the subject in the world. So we're very pleased to have him join us and to uh, begin and give us the keynote address. 
Thank you very much, uh, Natalia, <clears throat> for your introduction and good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure and privilege to participate in this webinar. What I'd like to do in my remarks is <clears throat> first <clears throat> to set the scene by talking a little bit about the salient features of foreign direct investment and then say a few words about three specific policy areas that might be of interest to Cuba in the context of foreign direct investment, namely investment facilitation, negotiating investment contracts, and an advisory center on international investment law. Well, let me begin with salient features. I think the key fact which we should keep in mind is that foreign direct investment has become the most important vehicle to deliver goods and services to foreign markets and integrate at the same time economies at the level of production. We have all heard about global value chains and of course they are an expression of this integration of uh, national economies. I think the, the extent to which foreign investment has become more important than trade is reflected in the fact that the sales of foreign affiliates are approximately 31 trillion, while world exports are 25 trillion. I think that gives us an idea of the magnitude of foreign direct investment and it's important for the development effort of individual countries. This foreign direct investment is being undertaken by over 200,000 multinational enterprises, meaning enterprises that control, that own or control assets abroad. Many of these uh, foreign affiliates, uh, in, in many of these foreign affiliates, uh, parent companies have over 50%, meaning they have control, but there are also various non-equity forms of controls like management contracts. And they are, for instance, uh, particularly prominent in the hotel industry, in tourism, but also in other industries. What is important to note also is that a good part of this multinational enterprises, maybe by now a third, if not more, are headquartered in developing countries. I think the implication of that is if Cuba is looking for foreign direct investment as it does, and my guess is we'll do in the future, you should not look only towards developed countries, but you have to look towards developing countries, particularly of course, Latin America, but in particular also Asia. Now, given the importance of foreign direct investment for development, all countries, all countries seek to attract such investment. There are three main tools to do that. The first one is to open the economy, to liberalize your foreign investment laws, and to establish an attractive regulatory framework. And we will be discussing during the webinar what that means. So I'm not going to go into that any, any further. Secondly, all countries or virtually all countries have established investment promotion agencies. Cuba has pro-Cuba to attract and facilitate foreign direct investment. By now, there are probably about at least 10,000 institutions 10,000 institutions worldwide that seek to attract investment. So obviously the implication is that the market for foreign direct investment is highly competitive. And the third way to try to attract foreign direct investment is by concluding international investment agreements, in particular bilateral investment treaties that protect, facilitate foreign direct investment. Cuba has, I think, about 60 bilateral investment treaties. Shouldn't overplay the role of bilateral investment treaties in terms of um, being able to attract foreign direct investment, but in certain circumstances, they certainly can play an important role. 
and they have played an increasingly important role in the light of investor state dispute settlement. So as a result of the competition for foreign direct investment, the laws regulating the entry and operation of foreign investors worldwide have become increasingly similar. Now, the implication of that is that the focus in order to make a difference in terms of attracting investment and facilitating investment is indeed shifting to a certain extent at least to investment facilitation. That means using various instruments to attract investment, to facilitate the operations of investors in the host country. Various mechanisms are involved. Most prominently, of course, is the establishment of one-stop shops where foreign investors get help to invest, use of incentives, even though incentives are often a waste, but you know they're being used. And also importantly, but often neglected, to provide after investment services. In other words, once the investor is established, to continue to work with the investor to help whatever problems may come up, keeping in mind that a satisfied foreign investor is your best uh, ambassador, so to speak. But also important because a good part of foreign direct investment is reinvested, consists of reinvested earnings. Foreign investment flows before the crisis worldwide were approximately 1.5 um, trillion uh, and uh, about uh, 160 billion went to Latin America. Of course, that has dropped by about 40%, if not more, uh, last year. But nevertheless, a good share of that investment consists of reinvested earnings. So after investment services remain very important. Now, uh, given that foreign direct investment laws are becoming similar and that most countries have concluded bilateral investment uh, treaties, the main name of the game is, as I mentioned, investment facilitation. All countries are engaged in it investment facilitation provisions are also finding their ways into international investment agreements. And my guess will be included increasingly in future international investment agreements, including bilateral investment treaties, or countries might even negotiate separate investment facilitation treaties. For instance, the EU is planning to do so. But the main international action at the moment is in the WTO, where over 100 governments are negotiating an investment facilitation framework for development. It's driven, it, this effort is driven by developing countries. It was chaired in the past by Colombia. At the moment, this exercise is chaired by Chile. It is meant to be an agreement that focuses entirely on technical issues, transparency, streamlining of administrative procedures, an investment facilitator, one-stop shop type of mechanism, and even some reference to responsible business conduct or CSR. Deliberately and explicitly, Sensitive issues like market access, protection, and investor state dispute settlement are excluded from the negotiations. At the same time, little attention is being paid so far to facilitating sustainable foreign direct investment. The efforts focus on facilitating investment, the assumption being that when investment comes, it will make on balance a contribution to development, and that's fine. But it doesn't really contain at the moment um, clauses 
that would focus specifically on investment facilitation measures that make a direct contribution to development, like creating linkages between foreign affiliates and domestic firms, because such linkages are particularly important to transfer the tangible and intangible assets of foreign affiliates to domestic firms, helping them uh, to upgrade these domestic firms. Or they don't contain special clauses for what I would call a recognized sustainable investor that makes a particular contribution to development. But all of this is still being negotiated, even though an advanced text exists so far. And the idea is to have the elements of an agreement in place by the next ministerial meeting at the end of November of this year. I think it's important for Cuba to participate in these uh, negotiations. They are not likely to be over by uh, this fall uh, in order to make sure that its interests are reflected as much of, as, uh, as possible during these negotiations. And by the way, if you're interested in learning more about this exercise, we have organized a high level ministerial round table uh, for Latin American countries tomorrow. A um, number of uh, vice ministers will be speaking. If you're interested in listening in it, send me an email and I'll make sure that uh, you get the link. So much for the salient features of foreign direct investment and the question of investment facilitation. Let me turn now quickly uh, to the question of investment contracts, state contracts. These are found, as you know better than I do, primarily in infrastructure and in extractive industries, but also in various non-equity contexts like uh, the tourism and hotel industry. These contracts obviously are very important in terms of determining the distribution of benefits between the host country and the foreign investors. Perhaps not only for a year, but for decades to come. They're often very complicated to negotiate, requires multidisciplinary experience, depending on the sector, different in natural resources, obviously, than infrastructure. The international investor typically has a human and financial resources to negotiate effectively. Many developing countries don't. My guess is Cuba might be among them. The result is that the host country does not always get the best possible contract it could potentially get. But regardless of what the contract is, you have to abide by it, pacta sunt semanda. And if you don't abide by it, you face potentially an investor state dispute settlement claim. And in fact, that quite a number of ISDS cases involve in one way or another state contracts, in particular in the infrastructure, extractive industries, and also in agriculture. So, and, and conducting international arbitration in the context of investor state dispute settlement is expensive in and by itself. And if you lose the arbitration, they can be even more expensive. So the lessons, the lesson is clear. You need to get your contract right, right from the beginning. Fortunately, there are at least two international institutions that provide some help. You have the International Senior Lawyer Project uh, that provides pro bono help in the legal area. And you have the Connex Support Unit that provides multidisciplinary support um, to countries that uh, request such help. Full disclosure, I'm involved with Connex. So I'm happy to tell you more about it and obviously um, can help to arrange for assistance if needed. And this brings me to my last topic very briefly, namely the question of an advisory center on international investment law. Most 
developing countries, well, actually the starting point is, as I mentioned, that investor state disputes are expensive and require specialized experience and knowledge to argue and to win. Most developing countries <clears throat> don't have the human and financial resources to engage successfully in ISDS cases. Hence, as part of the reform discussions that are taking place in UNCITRAL's working group three, UNCITRAL is the organization with UN, uh, within the UN system that deals with international legal matters, the idea and has been advanced to establish an advisory center on international investment law. It's patterned on the advisory center on WTO law that helps developing countries in any disputes involving the WTO and which has been very successful and is actually celebrating this year its 20th anniversary. So the idea is simply to have a similar type of center to help developing countries requesting such help to deal to assist it in investor state dispute settlement cases. The idea is widely supported and discussions are active, but it's not yet clear whether the center will be established and of course what its precise mandate will be. But, and this is basically my message, I think Cuba should actively participate in those discussions in UNCITRAL and work to make an advisory center happen. Cuba might well benefit from it, from such a center down the road. Naturally, if you want to have more information about this effort, feel free to let me know. So much for my introductory remarks. Let me re-emphasize that from a policy perspective, I think Cuba should keep a close eye, in fact, participate actively in the WTO and UNCITRA negotiations on investment facilitation and the reform of the investment regime and in particular the establishment of an advisory center um, in, the, in, in UNCITRA and it should keep an eye on CONEX and should keep CONEX in mind if and when negotiating investment contracts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Carl, uh, for that uh, overview and your recommendations. Uh, I go next, so let me share my screen here. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, does this work? Can you see it? Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about what we mean by foreign direct investment. And <clears throat> I mean substantial capital that's placed at risk, investments of $50 million or more, where the foreign investor participates in the local activity by bringing expertise, technology, it could be a wholly owned business, it could be an equity interest that is purchased in a local enterprise or a joint venture with a local partner. All of these types of investments rely on local institutions to organize the activities, the ability to create corporations, the ability to rely on local laws to uh, govern those activities and to resolve disputes. Um, <clears throat> it's not relying on the, on the uh, structure of the transaction for protection. In other words, in these transactions, you rely on the local institutions to resolve the disputes as opposed to how you structure the transaction. I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about what I mean by that a little bit later. But um, I wanted to make a point that losing an investment of capital is very different from losing a projected income stream. And an investor is gonna be very concerned about putting up capital uh, rather than um, th that's out of pocket as opposed to maybe a commercial transaction where it's gonna produce a certain amount of profits over a period of time. 
it's much more difficult to get an investor to put up the capital into a local enterprise. So get to having trouble with that. Okay, what is not for in direct investment? A lot of people uh, refer to management agreements, uh, which are which really are the arrangements that a lot of the tourist um, facilities have, Cuban tourist facilities have with outside managers, in particular, uh, Melia. These are revenues that are generated by both the foreign and domestic partner from the foreign partner's management and branding of the business in the host country. There's also licensing agreements. Uh, these are revenues generated by the foreign partner licensing technology from the host country partner and commercializing the technology abroad or marketing agreements. Uh, where revenues are generated by the foreign partner by selling abroad products to the host country. So I'll talk a little bit about FDI in the Cuban context. Um, most of the arrangements so far involve extractive industries. That is where the foreign partner lends capital to extract minerals or oil, and then the foreign partner commercializes the products abroad. It also, they also involve tourist facilities where the foreign partner brands and manages the hotel and sells the hotel's room abroad. The foreign partner in all of these transactions is paid first and then it delivers the pre-agreed portion to the host country partner. So it doesn't, these arrangements, uh, the structure of these arrangements is what provides the protection to the foreign investor. By getting paid first, the foreign investor has the upper hand and has the ability to uh, the, has a bargaining power to negotiate any dispute. It's not relying on local institutions, on local courts to resolve disputes. Other investments um, by very large multinational corporations have occurred in Cuba, um, but there have been investments of an insignificant amount for the corporation. Um, so for example, Nestle just made an investment in, of, of a coffee and biscuit facility in the Marielle Development Zone. It's a $58 million investment, which is substantial for the Cuban partner, but it's insubstantial for Nestle when you think that it represents 0.01% of its market cap of $330 billion. Um, so a very large company can afford to make a very small, what, what, is, what is for it a very small investment because they can afford to lose that investment um, because the, uh, uh, and, and not rely on local mechanisms, in the absence of local mechanisms to protect the investment. So I wanted to uh, talk about uh, three uh, companies or three companies that have substantial investments in Cuba and analyze the way that they structure their investments. The first is Sherit. And Sherit International is a public company. It, it, share, it trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange. It no longer trades in the United States. It's a, it's a world leader in mining and refining of nickel and cobalt. It has two types of investments in Cuba. One type is mining. It's processing and refining nickel and cobalt at MOA, Cuba which by the way, produces 11% of the world's supply of cobalt. It's an interesting um, figure. Um, and also it has, it's involved in oil and gas. It explores um, and produces oil and gas primarily from reservoirs located offshore on the North coast of Cuba. Now the mining operation is set up as a joint venture. It's a 50-50 part partnership with General Nickel Company, which is a Cuban entity. And the minerals are mined and processed in Cuba. Then they're transported to Saskatchewan, Alberta for processing and refining. And from there, they're sold primarily in Europe, Japan, and China. Now, the, the joint venture is vertically integrated. It means that it operates, all of the activities are done um, through these three subsidiaries. MOA Nickel owns and operates the MOA Cuba uh, mining and processing facilities. So mind you, now, Cuba and Sherrod both own MOA, and then they have these three subsidiaries. MOA Nickel operates the mine, and owns and operates the mine. The Cobalt Refinery Company owns and operates the Fort Saskatchewan Alberta Metal Refinery Facilities. That means that one of the subsidiaries owns uh, facilities in Canada, which means the Cuban entity is also a part owner of those facilities in Canada. Um, they're not all of the facilities at Saskatchewan, but part of the facilities there that are used for refining are owned by this joint venture. 
And then the third is International Cobalt Company, which is located in Nassau in the Bahamas, and it purchases the necessary material inputs for refining and then sells the finished nickel and cobalt. So it's the marketing arm of this venture. Um, in addition to the mining operations, Sherrod has oil and gas um, activities there. They're exploring off the north coast of Cuba. They have four production sharing contracts um, structured to pay Sherrod based on a discount from the U.S. Gulf Coast high sulfur fuel oil reference prices. And um, the way that the contract is, these contracts are structured is that um, First, a share it is paid for its investment cost to reimburse it for its investment costs, and that's referred to as a cost recovery oil. And second, a negotiated percentage of the remaining production is the profit oil, which is divided by among the by the two partners, the Cuban and Sherrod. Now, in addition to that, um, Sherrod has gotten involved in power generation. Um, they have a one-third interest in Energas, which is a joint venture with, a Cuban, with two Cuban government entities. One is Unión Eléctrica and the other one is Unión Cuba Petróleo. Now, all electrical generation produced by this Energas is purchased by UNE, and then all the byproducts are purchased by CUPET. So basically, the sole client for this activity is a Cuban entity. Um, so Sherrod provided the financing for the construction of the Energas facilities, and it's being repaid by cash flow from the activities. But Cuban agencies have access problems accessing hard currency, and they've had difficulty discharging obligations. And in particular, as of December 31, 2020, there were they owed um, shared $145.9 million, which they hadn't been able to um, uh, pay. Now, all of this information is obtained from um, the Sherrod uh, International Corporation, the most recent annual report uh, for the year 2020. So how does Sherrod manage the risk of non-payment? Now, in the mining business, it's had a 25-year relationship. It's based, it's developed um, a, you know, a, a certain amount of trust it's on both sides. They commercialize the nickel and the ore from the Saskatchewan facility, so they get paid first. Um, and then the MOA joint venture also owns the facilities for processing the mer uh, minerals with Sherrod. So in a way, it's like a, what it, they refer to sometimes as a joint hostage situation. Is they're joined at the hip and they, they succeed or fall together, and that provides a certain measure of, um, of protection. Now in the power business, on the other hand, where the arrangement requires that Cuba pay the partner in hard currency, it, it's shown to be risky because Cuba hasn't been able to access the currency to, 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 to pay, to, to cancel that receivable. So the next um, uh, one I wanted to talk about is the Melia Hotels. Melia, again, this is from their annual report for 2019, and then also a report they filed, the last report that they filed with the US, US um, SEC in 2003, which requires a lot more financial reporting than is required for uh, trading on whatever market they trade. They're publicly traded, but like a lot of um, European companies, they're most of the stock is owned by the founders and the family of the founders. It's, there's a, there's a, some other public uh, shareholders, but they decided to delist from the United States in 2003, so they no longer provide the detailed financial information that's required if you list in the United States. So they have 39 hotels in Cuba, but mind you, none, they don't own any of these hotels. They don't lease these hotels. They basically brand and manage the hotels. So there's about 15,000 rooms, 74% of the hotels are resort, 26% are located in the cities. Uh, their occupancy rate in 2019, uh, was 50%, which was an impact of the of the um, of the Trump sanctions of the U.S. sanctions on Cuba, and also there's also increased competition from other Caribbean locations for um, the Caribbean tourism. And Melia expects an increase, another drop as a result of Argentinian tourists, which apparently was a, a, a good source of tourism for these hotels because their government has now imposed a new tax on overseas purchases, so that will make it less attractive for them to go to Cuba. There's nonetheless, Amelia um, has confidence in uh, future activities in Cuba. They have four hotels in the pipeline and they're all gonna be branded and managed uh, by Amelia. 
Melia relies on its market power to promote the sales in Cuba. It has an extensive network of tour operators and 64% of its sales comes from tour operators. They have uh, part, they're part of a global distribution system of travel agencies, call centers and internet booking. And in the past they've made loans. I don't know how much in, the rec in recent years because I, can, I don't have access to that information from their current filings, but in the past, in their financial statements that they had to file with the SEC, they had made loans to Cuban entities in connection with refurbishing facilities. And those uh, loans were repaid from cash flow from the activities. So Melia is a seller of the rooms to the tour operators and to its network. So basically Melia protects its investment, doesn't have to rely on local institutions because they get paid first. And I just thought I'd point out an interesting figure, um, a Cuban economist, prominent Cuban economist, Miguel Figueras, who wrote an article on foreign contributions to the Cuban tourism industry, pointed out that foreign capital represents only 2% of the investment in the Cuban tourist industry, which is a surprising figure. Okay, the third um, company I wanted to highlight is the Trafigura Group. Um, it, Trafigura Group is a um, Singapore company that is a subsidiary of a privately held group uh, organized. It's a foundation organized in Panama. There's no, we don't know who the owners are. It's privately held. Um, they had entered into a joint venture with Empresa Minera del Caribe <clears throat> um, <clears throat> to uh, mine the Castellanos mine, to uh, mine zinc and lead. And they invested 297 million uh, through a loan to the joint venture. Again, <clears throat> this, these entities are basically not making equity investments, they're making loans. The investment arrangement takes the form of prepayments of hard currency. <clears throat> so basically pursuant to these agreements, Trafigura lends hard currency and then Cuba repays with ore delivery. So the contractually outstanding prepayments decrease in size with each cargo that is delivered. So this arrangement doesn't require Cuba to pay in hard currency, it's basically paying in ore. And so pursuant to the contract terms, as they pay the contract over a period of time, uh, it's extinguished at some point at the maturity and there's no remaining obligation by either party. Interest is added to the prepayment balance. So it's really treated like a loan and obviously there's um, print, there's a, a are going to be a profit component for Trafigura. So the question is, how is the non-payment risk managed by the foreign partner? Well, the payment by the Cuban entity under the contract is in, is in raw materials, not hard currency. They have an exclusive contract to market the ore internationally, and a significant amount of the um, of, that they are, are uh, scheduled to receive of that income stream is either financed on a non-recourse basis, like for example, selling all or part of the cash flow at a discount to someone who's willing to take higher risk, or it's insured by Trafigura. So this is the way that they manage the risk. But again, as you can see, none of these arrangements really rely on local institutions and they're not equity arrangements. They're essentially loans uh, that are repaid through um, providing uh, either minerals or selling the, or the hotel or in the hotel business. So the question is for Cuba is how is it gonna capture capital for other areas of the economy? And I think that's where arrangements with um, a foreign investor that has to put up substantial capital are gonna need more protections. And the current institutions don't yet exist in Cuba to give the foreign investor the, um, confidence that it can put up and make an equity investment of $50 million. And I don't mean a company, a mammoth company like Nestle, but you know, the, the average multinational company that has something to contribute um, may be able to do that at some point in the future if the regulatory framework develops. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the rest of the seminar um, with the other speakers. Um, you know, it's going to involve the ability to create business entities under accounting principles like in other parts of the world and dispute resolution mechanism between independent tribunals. With that, I'd like to stop because these um, uh, uh, topics will continue to be discussed in the rest of the seminar. Thank you for your attention. And let me exit from here. So the next speaker 
is Jorge Piñon. Jorge, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Um, Jorge is the director at the University of Texas at Austin Center for International Energy and Environmental Policy for Latin America and the Caribbean Energy and Environmental Program. He began his 32 year career in the energy sector when he joined Shell, oil company supply and transportation organization. He was president and CEO of Trans World Oil USA prior to joining Amoco Corporation as president of Amoco a corporate development company in Latin America. In this position, he represented the business development and joint venture efforts in Latin America between Amoco and state oil companies. He has a lot more credentials to his name, but that's just a brief summary. You can look at his bio and get more information. So let me turn it over to Jorge. Thank you, uh, Natalia. Let me go ahead and, and get my presentation in place. All right, can everybody see it? Uh, yes. Again, uh, good morning. And I'd like to thank uh, ASCII and, and Columbia Law School for uh, your kind invitation. Uh, first of all, with all respect to my fellow panel members, I am not an attorney. Um, so what I'm going to share with you are my experiences, uh, just as the conference uh, title indicates. Uh, as Natalia pointed out, um, I worked for a uh, large part of my 34 year career in what we call new country entry strategies and at least six uh, transnational joint ventures uh, when I was with Shell, Amoco, and then uh, with PBP. I would also like to give credit to some of my analysis and comments to the consult management firms such as McKenzie and Bustarin and others that we always hire to validate um, our findings. Um, and we learn quite a bit from them. So I'm also going to be sharing some of my learnings from uh, those companies. I uh, also want to highlight that my comments are not based on small investments by mid-cap companies uh, that have a much shorter term uh, entrepreneurial horizon. Uh, and also, I'm not going to be addressing SMEs or small, medium-sized enterprises, even though they're very important. Uh, but I'm going to be addressing major capital investments uh, by Fortune 100 companies in which they really put substantial capital at risk. And by the way, very important for the analysis, usually those projects have anywhere between three to five year development timeline. In other words, once you sign the agreement to invest, the time that you get to monetization of those assets could very well take anywhere between uh, three to up uh, to five years. Uh, let's see here. Um, as Carl uh, said, and also Natalia, but mainly Carl, uh, I, I think the issue in, in transitional economies is not necessarily the written law or the regulation, uh, but really is the uncertainty on the administration, the interpretation, and the enforcement of the law. And also very, very important, the regulatory side. Is the regulation system fair, transparent, not corrupt, non-political? And it's an efficiently administered. Uh, we can all take a look at uh, La Ley de Inversión Extranjera of Cuba 118 um, and read it and interpret uh, that legislation. But the question is going to be, is the enforcement going to be fair, uh, particularly when your counterparty uh, happens to be a state-owned enterprise? There are other issues that are also very important. These are commercial and business issues, uh, which is taxes. Uh, trade barriers, uh, local labor regulations and employment agreements. Uh, by the way, many emerging and transitional economies today are going after what they call local content rules um, in which the government requires company to use certain percentage of domestic manufactured goods and services. Uh, I hope that if Cuba ever implements uh, LCRs, they're very careful and don't follow, for example, uh, the experience of Brazil, 
in which when they open up uh, the LCR participation by the state or by the host country was as high as 60%. Uh, eventually they had to come down to 25, 30% because it created a huge bottleneck uh, to the implementation of those uh, foreign investment. Other issues to consider again in transitional economies, and remember transitional economies are centralized political and economic models that are going through a period of decentralization or quasi free market models. Uh, the inherence of political uh, bureaucracies, uh, that's extremely, extremely important. Uh, case in point, for example, um, is uh, in Iraq in 2003, with the rebaptization of, of the whole uh, government structure, uh, which created a huge vacuum uh, in Iraq beginning in 2003. Um, who, was, uh, who was in charge? Uh, there was nobody in charge. Uh, and that created a, a huge uh, bottleneck again um, in investment in Iraq. So the inheritance of political bureaucracies that are going to implement the new rules and the new regulations uh, of investment uh, is very important. Another one is what we call society spheres, ethics, values, uh, and attitudes. Uh, over 80%, over 80% of Cuba's population today was born after 1959. How are they going to behave after 60 plus years of living in a paternalistic society? Uh, that's a big question uh, for many of us. Data. Um, how reliable uh, is the data, all data, uh, in a statistical analysis of historical economic uh, and financial models? Uh, really, from my point of view, we throw it out the window. Uh, it's useless, uh, particularly business data. Uh, in the US and other country, we follow generally accepted accounting rules, gap rules. Uh, so we have to be very careful when we take a look at the economies and bus the business results, the financial results of Cuba, whether they're state agencies or not, uh, because the data is uh, questionable. Some issues also come to, to mind, uh, impose strong government or what I call police state risks. Uh, that is the change of the level of security and safety in the host country, the probable increase of drug trafficking in the host country, the increase of corruption in the host country. And I want to remind that those of us that work for US companies have to follow the FCPA rules, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, with many Euro which many European companies uh, don't necessarily have to follow. The question that we were always asked at the board of directors level when we went out with a new country entry project was, political instability and continuity. The board will tell us, both the legal team and the business team, fine, I understand the commercial risk. I, I understand uh, the risk legally that we face, but what guarantee can you give me that there's not going to be a change in government by which they're going to change the rules of the game three, five, seven years down the road? Good case in point today is Mexico. In 2013 and 14, Mexico enacted constitutional reforms, allowing the participation of foreign energy companies uh, in Mexico and the end of the Pemex monopoly. Well, today you have the administration of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who is reversing, certainly today, all of the regulatory enforcement that guarantee that participation. And in June, we're having new elections in Mexico, which will create a whole new Congress and also decide on the majority of the state legislatures and governorship. It is highly likely that they will change the energy reform. And this is an energy reform which has seen already $14 billion invested in the country and another $40 billion in the pipeline of future investment in the energy sector. What's going to happen in Mexico if they change the rules of the game? Again, as far as Cuba is concerned, is this a new and political and economic model or is it more of the same? I'm going to talk about it in my last slide. What is going to be the future of US-Cuba trade and economic policies? And I'm not talking only about the lifting of the embargo, but trade policy, 
uh, is Cuba going to be a member of the Central American DR uh, trade group? Uh, what, are, what are the rules vis-a-vis -vis the US, which is going to be its largest market participant um, as far as Cuba is concerned? This is very important. And that is the role of the Cuban military in the economy. When you look at GAESA and, and CMEX, and you know, Carl talked about CSRs or uh, environmental, social, and corporate governance programs. Uh, we have to be very careful uh, because US shareholders today are demanding quite a bit uh, from the companies uh, that they own. Uh, we have seen recent calls for boycott of products made with cotton from Xinjiang region in China uh, due to allegations of forced labor in the country in the cotton industry, uh, as an example. So uh, we have to be very careful with that. We have to resolve the issues of outstanding property claims, particularly in land tenancy uh, rights uh, in agriculture. Also, disposable income and consumer spending. You know, when you look at the US GDP, 70% of uh, GDP in the US is determined by consumer demand. And this is where, by the way, small, medium-sized enterprises and programs like the one that uh, Margaret Craham uh, runs at Columbia are very important. Uh, the Cuban middle class certainly has to grow uh, for foreign direct investment uh, to come in. Um, I think Natalia uh, raised the main issue that I, that I have, and that is, uh, you know, Cuba announced, what was it, $1.5 billion in 2018, uh, 1.7 in 19, and then $1.9 billion of FDI in 2020. Uh, what is it? Uh, when you look at the Dominican Republic that reported $2.5 for 2020, I can see it. I can kick the tires. Uh, regrettably, I cannot kick the tires and identify what are Cubans' FDIs. Uh, you know, Rodrigo Malmierca announced 34 new businesses as part of this 2020 $1.9 uh, billion FDI. What are they? Uh, he also announced that there were 503 new projects in the pipeline in tourism, biotechnology, and pharmaceuticals, and wholesale trade for the amount of $12 billion. Who, why, when, what, where, how? Uh, all of this data uh, is needed uh, so that we can run probability analysis on the success of some of this uh, so-called investments. You know, MOUs and LOIs, I signed many of them throughout my career, and they usually make the headline. So-and-so signed an agreement to invest $200 million in a petrochemical plant. Well, all that it was is really an MOU. Uh, I am focused more on hard capital investment in fixed assets, property, plant, and equipment of more than 100 million. Now you're putting uh, something at, at risk. And as Natalia mentioned, um, you have to look at, for example, she already went into share it. Uh, she talked about Melia. Uh, let me point out an important happening here last year in which Hong Kong-based Ally Cigar Corporation acquire, acquired Imperial Brands premium cigar business for $1.4 billion. Now, the Imperial Brands premium cigar business was 50% Havanos, 50% of Altabama, 50% of international Cubana de Tabaco, 50% of Promotora de Cigarros, and also the exclusive distribution of Cuban handmade cigars in Spain. So here's a major transaction, uh, which by the way, just this past Thursday on the 29th, uh, Imperial Brands uh, reported that the transaction was funded and is now done. Um, again, uh, the acquisition by Hong Kong based group uh, of 50% uh, of basically Cuba's uh, cigar business. So if you look at Sherrod, if you look at Pernod Ricard, if you look at Imperial Blends, if you look at Melia investment, they're large, uh, but we have to differentiate. Natalia raised a very important issue. And I asked, why is Unilever and Nestle in Cuba uh, with investments of less than $35 million uh, to manufacture soap and deodorants and Nescafe and Nesquik? Uh, when eventually they're going to have to face the competition of, of, of giants such as Colgate, Palmolive, uh, and Procter and & Gamble. Uh, so this is a big, big question that we have. She went over Trafigura, 
basically Total and Castro are small. Uh, Essencia, by the way, uh, is the company that invested supposedly $186 million in a bagasse um, uh, plant in the Lucero Redondo uh, sugar mill to produce 300 megawatts uh, of electricity. And then you have the small less than 50 million investments like rich meat from Mexico in El Mariel, uh, General Paint, which by the way, eventually is going to have to, to compete uh, versus Sherwin Williams. Um, so why are, they, why are they in Cuba and really what is the capital at risk? Um, quickly, when you look at joint ventures with uh, state enterprises, why would you joint venture with the Cuban state enterprises? You, usually because of market entry or market share, because they have a technology that you don't have, because they have efficient manufacturing facilities that you don't have, because they have a brand value, because they have capital. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I tend to see any of the Cuban state enterprises that fall into this, into this category. If you look, for example, at Tijana de Acero, which is Cuba's largest sugar, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, steel mill, you know, 2,100 workers, inefficient manufacturing technology. Do we see companies like Nucor, US Steel, uh, ArcelorMittal uh, really investing in Tijana de Acero? Uh, I doubt it very much. What I see is investment, and I think it's needed in infrastructure. Somehow we need uh, like uh, an FDR, um, uh, new deal uh, in which we see uh, major investments um, in, in water and sewer, highway and bridges, power generation, all of this infrastructure uh, that is going to be needed. Um, to conclude, I, I went back and I found this document, which is a report by the Congressional Research Service uh, from 20 years ago. Um, and they were looking at Cuba opening up for foreign investment. Look at their, my, I, I pulled this text out of their conclusion uh, at the end of this study. And they say that market reform in Cuba is not being conducted. And again, this is 2002. It's not being conducted for its own sake, but for the perfection of socialism. They also say the fundamental contradictions between centrally planned and free market economies threatened to complicate further reform efforts. They also add that as a result, tension will probably continue between the regime's desire to introduce market forces and its ideological commitment to Marxism. I tell you, this is 2002, and I'll argue with you that it can be repeated today. And to finalize it, uh, I look at grandma every morning. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I look at grandma every morning because I have to become, I, I have to learn uh, what the thinking of the Cuban government is. And this is this morning's front page of grandma had two articles. One on Marx, again, emphasizing the commitment of the Cuban revolution and of the Cuban government to Marxism. And also on the front page, talking about customer service in Cuba how Cuba has bad customer service and how we have to improve customer service, uh, particularly to attract foreign investment. Uh, so in conclusion, yes, I welcome the efforts that, that Cuba is moving forward, uh, but I do question uh, whether long-term uh, they're going to provide uh, the Cuban people uh, with the benefits, both socially and economically and politically uh, that we all aspire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. Um, while he removes his slides and starts sharing the screen, um, let me ask uh, participants to submit their questions through the Q&A uh, feature. And also, Frank, if you're available, if you could just shut off the chat so that it's available only for the panelists to communicate and coordinate with each other. Um, all right, so our next speaker uh, is Pedro Freire, who is the chair of the law firm Ackerman um, International Practice. Well, it's Ackerman. Uh, he's the chair of the international practice at the law firm of Ackerman. And he uh, has a full service team advising multinational and global corporations on a wide range of cross-border mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, capital market transactions, syndicated and secured lending, construction, and other international disputes. Mr. Freire is an internationally recognized authority on the US embargo on Cuba, 
uh, and there were evolving regulations enacted since the restoration of diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba. Most recently, he has been instrumental in guiding clients with respect to the defense of claims arising from the implementation of Title III of helms Burton. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Pedro to um, uh, begin his presentation. Thank you, Pedro. So well, thank you, Natalia, and thank you to ASCII and to Columbia University for this fantastic opportunity. Uh, at the onset, I want to make clear that uh, I'm here a little bit under false pretenses because my experience and my comments in relation to Cuba will not pertain to uh, direct foreign investment, but rather I wanna comment a little bit on the edges of the regulatory environment in Cuba. Uh, mainly constitutional issues which constrict uh, the ability to transact uh, really good, efficient uh, business with Cuba. And number two, my uh, hypothetical on my practical experience, highlighting my practical experience on obtaining regulatory permits to operate in Cuba. Uh, I will start by noting that while I have not coordinated my presentation with anybody who has gone before me or who comes after me, I am already seeing a number of the comments and a number of the observations that resonate with my experience and that I think you're going to, to see as, uh, as I go through my materials are very pertinent uh, to foreign direct investment. So th the first thing I want to say sort of as a, to lay the premise on this is Cuba, as we have heard, is by all measures, a small market in the global context. That said, it is a significant market opportunity and a significant potential market in terms of being the largest uh, island in the Caribbean, its proximity to the United States and its potential in areas like obviously tourism, but also agriculture and biotechnology. The smallness of the Cuban market, I have observed, uh, create a number of tensions and certainly frustrations on the Cuban side because sometimes I found that Cuban officials and, and ordinary Cubans fail to understand why there isn't uh, more movement in the area of re bilateral relations with Cuba and also on the practical level, why certain things don't happen uh, fluidly and, and, and without hindrance. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about financial and banking transitions, uh, transactions. Even at the height of the Obama opening when the US government was very actively promoting bilateral exchanges and facilitating financial transactions, US banks were extremely reluctant to enter the Cuban market. And the Cubans posited that this was because of some hidden hindrance or regulation or political pressure. And, and, and the reality was that it was a simple matter of, of the market. The Cuban market continues to be very small and the risk benefit analysis that a bank goes through in doing a banking transaction, not so much from the uh, framework of the Cuban assets control regulation, but from very mundane issues like know your customer, uh, simply don't warrant entering the Cuban market. And, and Cuba had difficulty understanding that that was so. So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem there. And, and, and that's, that's sort of one of the underlying uh, foundational problems in, in the relationship. Um, shifting now to, I also wanted to make a couple of other practical observations before I go into the, the topic, which is in dealing with the, the Cuban interlocutors uh, uh, that I have done since the year 2014, a couple of interesting things have happened. Number one, my observation is that by and large, uh, the people that I have dealt with are competent, uh, you know, technically, technically up to date in what they're doing in most instances and eager to try to help within a very constricted framework. And let me emphasize that. The constrictions on the framework certainly lie on the side of the United States from the US embargo. And this is not the topic of today's conversation, so I won't go into that but it's the 500 pound gorilla in the room. And then there's another 500 pound gorilla in the room that I will talk about, which is the constraints, the constitutional constraints in Cuba. And I would submit also the societal and uh, overall 
ambience constraints of this commitment to the framework of, of a socialist system. With that, uh, let me go to my first slide, my first substantive slide on what is missing. And, and the topic of my presentation was supposed to be what is missing from the Cuban regulatory framework. And I, I scratched out regulatory and I substituted that for constitutional. And the reason I did that is Cuba just went through an exercise in amending its constitution. And as recently as 2019, it enacted a new constitution which went through an internal uh, vetting process within the party and so forth. And what emerged was a modified constitution, but one that maintained the, for example, the preeminent role of the Cuban Communist Party in directing society and so forth. But even within that constitutional framework, I wanted to call your attention to a couple of issues that are problematic for people who want to invest in Cuba. And, and the first one has to do with the independent judiciary. And if you look at Article 149, it says that the magistrates and lay judges of the People's Supreme Court are elected by the National Assembly of People's Power or by the Council of State. So right there you have the issue of uh, how do you become a judge or a magistrate in Cuba? And you see that the appointments come from that framework of people's power and the Council of State. So therefore, the independence of the ju judiciary, although also enshrined in the constitution, uh, becomes suspect uh, by the nature of the appointment process of the judges. The second point is Article 154, which states that the People's Supreme Court reports to the National Assembly of People's Power regarding the results of its activities in the form with the frequency established by law. And here again, we have a constitutional restraint that basically puts the courts under the ages of the executive power and, and the uh, legislative power. It does not augur well for an independent judiciary, which is one of the linchpins of making a country attractive to foreign investment. But beyond that, I think one of the most problematic uh, features of the Cuban constitution is Article 19, which says that the state directs, regulates, and monitors economic activity, reconciling national, territorial, collective, and individual interests for the benefit of society. Socialist planning constitutes the central component of the system of governance for economic and social development, its, its essential function is to design and conduct strategic development and planning for relevant balances between resources and needs. And the issue there is that we have this enormous power within that small world of the Cuban economy, which is the state institutions, the state entities, the state empresas, which occupy most of the economic space in the country, albeit there is a growing and, and surprisingly uh, vigorous private sector, which of course has been hurt very badly by the Trump administration's constraint on relations with Cuba and COVID-19. So it's been impacted massively, but that leaves the economic arena in the control substantially of the state players. So that, that that's, that's an issue and it's problematic to foreign investment. Continuing with that topic, uh, under Article 27, uh, socialist state business is the primary subject of the national economy. They have autonomy in their administration and management, perform the primary role in the production of goods and services and comply with their social responsibility and the law regulates the principle of their organization and operation. And the wording that I wanna call your attention to is that the first opening sentence, the socialist state business is the primary subject of the national economy. By enshrining that in the constitution, uh, what, what, what the Cuban government has done is it has reinforced that perception of 50, 60 years now, uh, somebody mentioned that previously, where the the national consciousness of the role of the state in the economy is that the state is the economy. And as, as long as that continues to be the case, 
my observation is that the ability of Cuba to really develop and grow and, and attract investment and generate value in its economy is going to continue to be severely constrained. Looking now at Article 29, and, and this one goes to the issue of the agriculture, which is an area that is risk and opportunity for Cuba, risk that it continues to see this very low production and, and this inability to feed its own population and therefore uh, have to invest uh, resources to bring in food from the, uh, the outside. An opportunity in the sense that there's a very large portion of the Cuban agricultural sector that is rife for redevelopment and growth and so forth, and which I, I submit would take off rather quickly if the shackles are, are lifted. But you see in Article 29 that it states private property over land is regulated by a special framework, leasing, sharecropping, and mortgage loans to individuals are prohibited. So right there, you have a big constraint on, on generating capital. The onerous trading or transmission of this good may only be realized in compliance with the requirements established by the law and without prejudice to the preferential right of the state to the acquisition of land through the payment of a just price. So there you have a preemptive right in favor of the state to acquire land in the event of a transfer. Non-onerous transfers of ownerships or of right of use and enjoyment of the property is carried out by prior authorization of the competent authority and in accordance with that which is prescribed by law. Once again, a restraint is put into the transfer of, of land. Article 30 provides that the concentration of property in natural or legal non-state persons is regulated by the state, which also guarantees an increasingly just redistribution of wealth in order to conserve the limits that are compatible with the socialist values of equity and social justice. The law establishes regulations that guarantees its effective enforcement. And this last provision reinforces what I have observed is a, a very uh, pervasive uh, perception in Cuban society at all levels that this accumulation, accumulation of wealth by its very nature is in some ways unethical or, or unjust. And this again, I submit, creates a very significant barrier to the creation of capital value worth and economic activity in Cuban society. So those are some of the constraints that are within the Cuban constitutional framework. Uh, Cuba had the opportunity to change these. I know that there was debate internally. I cannot comment on how vigorous or open that debate was. I wasn't a party to that. But the end result was that we still have a structure for governing Cuba that assigns that preeminent role to state enterprises and which uh, sets some very substantial limits on the ability to transfer property in the context of agriculture and so forth. So I wanted to share that constitutional snapshot with the participants in the seminar so that we have sort of this underpinning of some of the constraints within Cuban society for loosening up and really becoming a, a much more attractive, much more inviting environment for uh, investment. If we can move to the next slide, please. So shifting gears now, I wanted to go to the opposite edge of the regulatory environment. And in order to protect the confidentiality of my clients and my ongoing activities, I, want, I came up with a fanciful a uh, project of uh, obtaining authorization to fly a drone. Let me give the caveat that this is not intended to reflect any particular client nor any particular activity, nor in, or, although I use the names of several Cuban ministries, it's not intended to reflect any particular ministry or, or its role, but I did want to convey the general um, process and, and contact uh, procedure in order to obtain, in this case, operational permits in Cuba. So in this hypothetical of obtaining permission to fly a drone around the area, uh, the, the Cuban national airspace, 
um, I start with the issue of who do you contact? And, and, and one of the things that we learned in that brief uh, shining moment of opening with Cuba during the Obama era is that it wasn't obvious who you needed to talk to. And that goes back to an issue mentioned in an earlier presentation of facilitating the, the interactions, facilitating the regulatory framework. And I think the Cubans began to understand the value of having a one-stop shop, or as they called it, a ventana única, because it was a very, a very confusing uh, scenario for newly arrived uh, US interlocutors. Uh, the question became, do you go through MinREX? Do you knock at the door of the Cuban embassy in DC and their, uh, corp you know, their, their corporate and trade advisors? Uh, do you go to the Ministry of Transportation, which is the one that would logically uh, have authority over uh, flying uh, objects? Or do you go direct directly to the aviation directory or to the helicopter and rotary wing subdirectory? Or do you then go, or do you first go to the Territorial Drone Authority? Uh, if you're gonna be flying your drones in Cienfuegos, is that the door that you knock on? Or do you go to the Ministry of Tourism and say, look, this is something that we're doing uh, in relation to tourism and get them involved? Or finally, do you, do you go to the Ministry of Information because the drones can be used to disseminate information throughout the national territory? Uh, as our relations with Cuba progressed and hopefully continue to progress, this process needs to be streamlined and there needs to be much clearer direction on how, how an entity or individuals who want to invest in the Cuban economy or obtain any kind of regulatory uh, permission uh, go about their business in doing so. And, and streamlining really, as I'm gonna focus now, the actual procedure for obtaining those permits. So let me now move to, in, in this hypothetical, the actual process of obtaining permission to fly a drone. So once we figured out that initial contact, uh, who the interlocutor is, that interlocutor would provide the guidelines for doing the application process. And it starts with, uh, what kind of visa you need and so forth. But once you do that, the application needs to be very formally notarized and authenticated. You need to then go back to all your contact points. There's usually a committee that looks at the activities that you propose. Sometimes they provide a deadline, sometimes they don't. There's a secondary committee that involves the actual operational decisions. And then there's uh, sometimes they tell you that there are other instances, other resources, or recourses that they have to go through, which are not very transparently. And finally, like in the Willy Wonka factory, the golden ticket emerges and you are authorized to proceed. I am being told that my time is up. Uh, I hope you've gotten some benefit out of this. And once again, thank you to ASCII, Natalia and Colombia for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your remarks, Pedro. I um, appreciate them. Um, sorry to cut you off, but I'm trying to keep everybody on schedule here. So our next speaker is Christine Concepcion, who's going to uh, discuss, well, let me just tell you about her. She, she'll tell you what she's going to discuss. She's an attorney at the law firm of McDermott, Will & Emery, focusing her practice on U.S. and international tax matters for multinational businesses. She advises predominantly Spanish and French-speaking clients on U.S. pre-immigration planning, inbound investments, treaty planning, expatriate uh, creation and income and estate tax planning matters. She has an LLM in tax from Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and her experience includes working in the international tax group at the accounting firm of Deloitte uh, where she worked on structuring international transactions. And uh, uh, welcome to the seminar, Christine, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Natalia. So I'm gonna be speaking about the international tax and accounting considerations of FDI in Cuba. So first off, to summarize the issues that I'm gonna be talking about, I'm gonna be discussing um, what happens when we're starting a business in Cuba or in a foreign country, and what are the bodies of laws that we need in order for a US business 
or also a foreign business to be interested in any particular foreign country. I'm also going to be discussing uh, what type of taxes are foreign investors looking at. We're going to talk about interest, dividends, capital gains, and transfers of real estate. I'm also going to be talking about the existence of uh, an income tax treaty. Uh, something that businesses are always looking at is whether there's an income tax treaty in the foreign country that they're in, interested in investing. And then finally, I'm going to be discussing uh, accounting rules and regulations. Okay. So when a U.S. business is looking to invest in a foreign country, uh, the U.S. business is first going to consider the, um, the body of corporate law that is available in the host country. The host country must have a body of corporate law that is similar to the body of corporate laws of other countries. Similarities with other bodies um, of law of law makes it easier for the U.S. government to understand the laws of host countries like Cuba. Without similarities, the U.S. business and the U.S. government may not agree as to the treatment of entities, which would result in litigation and an aversion to investment in a country like Cuba that does not have similar laws to that of other countries. A good example would be uh, for Cuba, it could, Cuba could enact laws similar to other countries like uh, those that are found in the U.S. or Latin America, bodies of laws that would uh, distinguish between a corporation, an LLC, or how we see in Latin America, una limitada, uh, and partnerships. It's also important to note that the existence of a contractual agreement between two parties is not sufficient to constitute an entity for purposes of foreign investment. Therefore, such contractual agreements that could be found in Cuba or among parties between Cuba um, risk causing confusion as to the treatment of the entity and could dissuade investors from investing in Cuba. Then uh, here we have entity selection in Cuba and why is this important? First of all, the type of entity selected as the investment vehicle in the foreign country materially affects the US federal income tax consequences imposed on the direct and indirect uh, shareholders. So contractual agreements between parties to the terms are not sufficient. And it's important for, you, for US tax reasons because it affects taxes of the parent company and the ultimate US shareholders. It affects the treatment of capital contributions to the entity in Cuba, dividends or distributions made from Cuba to the US, sales of business assets and loans between the Cuban subsidiary and the US parent. The type of entity selected as the investment vehicle in the foreign country materially affects the US federal income tax consequences imposed on the direct and indirect shareholders. Without a clear separation, the US parent could be subject to additional and unnecessary taxes as a result of force of attraction rules that encompass, that includes, that brings in more income and subjects that income to taxes. And the goal is to limit as much as possible the taxes that are imposed uh, in the foreign country. So US, oh, and then, so then entity selection continued here. Um, ideally the US shareholders would structure the investment in Cuba using a type of entity that would limit ex exposure to the unfavorable and mitigable US uh, tax laws. It's important to be able to separate and encapsulate the activities in Cuba so that the US parent is not tainted by the activities in Cuba and subjected to certain laws. We're trying to just make sure that we have silos of businesses and having a separate entity achieves this, uh, achieves this goal. So investors must be able to analyze the activities of each entity located in a foreign jurisdiction. And without a separate legal entity, it's not possible to distinguish these, these activities. And it's especially important for public companies that are regulated because investors are gonna be looking at each country and each silo of a business in order to determine whether this is a type of business and company that they wanna invest in. And then in order for a US investor to consider investing in the foreign Country, the foreign country must have laws that clearly describe the elements that constitute each type of entity. For example, the laws should discuss uh, the following elements, the liability of owners of each type of entity. For example, do any entities have limited liabilities for all of the owners, for only some of the owners? Uh, must any owner have unlimited liability? Is there a registry of existing entities 
that is easily accessible by the public. Is this registry, this registry would state the full legal name of the entity, the date of the formation, among other things. Another issue, another element that would be important in these rules is how quickly can an entity be formed? Can it be formed online? If not, this poses a significant problem. For example, an entity in Delaware can be formed within hours. By contrast, an entity in Brazil might take three to five months to form. Another issue is, does an entity require a local bank account in order to be formed? In the US is technically not required, but by contrast in Brazil it is. Requiring a bank account in order for an entity to be formed poses a significant challenge, regardless of what country the investment is located, if there's no local individual investor. Another important element to consider is whether the entity requires a local registered agent. A registered agent um, is required in the US because the registered agent is the person or the company uh, that is responsible for accepting service of process in the event of a lawsuit or legal action. And here is an example of a body of corporate laws that Cuba could refer to uh, if it would like to move forward and start enacting laws similar to other countries. So I list in the US, we have the, Gen the Delaware General Corporations Law, which is a body of law designed to regulate a uh, corporation which is different from a limited liability company, which is also different from a limited partnership. I also include Florida Business Corporations Act and Florida Revised Limited Liability Company Act. These are all different bodies of laws uh, that regulate different types of entities. And then here, uh, I also include Spain, Belgium, and France. Uh, and these are different types, this is uh, different countries' laws, uh, and, and these would be great models um, as reference if Cuba's interested in uh, looking at what other countries are doing. So here we have tax considerations. Um, another issue that the business is gonna consider is uh, what, are the what are the taxes in the foreign country? going to consider uh, corporate income tax, taxes on interest, dividends, rents and royalties, uh, also short-term and long-term capital gain. So if a company sells an asset uh, or if an individual sells an asset, uh, what are the, the capital gains on that sale? Uh, a U.S. company is also going to consider whether withholding tax applies to transfers from the foreign country to the U.S. So for example, if if, uh, there is, if, if a U.S. company loans money to Cuba and Cuba to remit interest to the U.S. on that loan, does Cuba impose a withholding tax on that interest payment? And it'll also consider any other taxes, uh, hopefully, which can be mitigated. Uh, the U.S. business will consider how foreign taxes affect the taxes it pays in the U.S. So for example, the US tax code allows certain businesses to credit taxes paid in a foreign country provided that certain tests are met. So for example, a tax imposed on local business to pay for healthcare is not necessarily a tax that will be creditable in the United States. Therefore, Cuba would, it, it would consider the types of taxes that will incentivize the US business and shareholders to invest in Cuba. And here we have income tax treaties. Another consideration is the existence of income tax treaties uh, when, a US is, when a US business is considering investing in a foreign country. Uh, you may be asking yourself, why is an income tax treaty an incentive for, to foreign investment? Well, it's because an income tax treaty reduces or even eliminates certain taxes between certain shareholders and its foreign subsidiaries. Oftentimes, a business is going to engage in treaty shopping uh, in order to determine which country is best for its foreign investment. So I've had a few clients that say, you know what, we're interested in making an investment in two or three different countries. Uh, Christine, can you do an analysis of what country we should invest in that is going to reduce our taxes the most? Which country is going to have an income tax treaty that is going to take the withholding tax from 30% to maybe 5%, okay? 
so for example, the US-UK income tax treaty reduces withholding tax on dividends from 30% down to as low as 5%, depending on uh, the shareholder that's receiving the dividend, okay? And then accounting considerations, which was uh, mentioned in, uh, earlier in the presentation in, in, in the webinar. Uh, so public companies must report at least quarterly their business activities uh, and activities domestic and foreign uh, to the public. So such reports must comply with either GAAP or IFRS. So GAAP refers, GAAP is, stands for the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles and GAAP refers to a common set of accounting principles, standards, and procedures issued by the Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB. Uh, public companies in the US must follow GAAP uh, when their accountants compile their financial statements. GAAP is a combination of authoritative standards set by policy boards and commonly accepted ways of recording and reporting accounting information. Uh, by contrast, IFRS, it stands for the International Financial Reform Reporting Standards. It's the international equivalent to GAAP. Uh, it's followed in over 120 countries, including those in the EU. So a country interested in receiving foreign investment should adopt either GAAP or IFRS um, reporting standards that govern local entities, or else it's gonna be very difficult to attract investment in foreign, uh, investment from foreign public companies. This is not as relevant uh, for individual investors, even though it would help. And why, so why is this necessary? So the ultimate goal of GAAP and IFRS is to ensure that a company's financial statements are complete, consistent, and comparable. It makes it easier for investors to analyze and extract useful information uh, from the company's financial statements, including trend data over a period of time. It also facilitates the comparison of financial information across different companies. So if, uh, again, if I'm a public investor or if I'm an investor in a public company and we are ready to deploy money to, an, to buying another business or to setting up another business abroad, I'm going to be comparing different types of companies and seeing, well, is this a viable business idea? Um, so they're, they're gonna compare different financial statements uh, from different companies and determine how and what type of business they're going to um, enter into. Uh, so, and a company that does not standardize its financial reporting rules to match GAAP or IFRS is going to have a difficult time attracting investors who are subject to GAAP or IFRS in their local country. Uh, another reason that financial standards are necessary is because there is a need in the investment world to account for transactions and the financial results in the foreign country, country separately from the financial results and the transactions in the country of its investors. So we really need to separate it. Uh, and again, this just makes sure that whatever investments are made abroad, um, we can look at them independently of everything and just ensure that that investment is actually a good investment. The goal is to not basically commingle investments so that you just don't understand what is going on in the company. And investors need to be able to analyze in an easy to understand matter, trend data, how the company's doing financially. And without accounting standards, the investor really can't compare apples to apples. Uh, furthermore, the investors auditors, again, public companies, um, will look at local laws and compare it to the laws of its own country. Uh, look at the transaction documents um, before they make a determination of whether the transaction is sound and how it is to be reported on the investor's financial statements. It's not sufficient that the local country has its own rules. We need to look at this in, in a more global sense. And then, so in conclusion, in order to move forward, um, any country, especially Cuba, is um, if it's serious about attracting a significant amount of foreign direct investment, particularly from, uh, from companies that are public, it must begin by enacting a body of corporate law that is similar to that of other countries. It also must take into consideration how the laws of the investor country treats taxes in Cuba and the distribution of profits from Cuba to the investor country. Cuba should also consider enacting either GAAP or IFRS so that accounting for transactions 
in Cuba is comparable to that of other countries. Uh, Cuba should also explore what countries are willing to negotiate an income tax treaty because the existence of an income tax treaty uh, with multiple countries is really going to attract investment. Um, and, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Christine. You are in you, exact timing. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Um, now, our last speaker is Ricardo Ampudia, who is a registered international arbitrator and litigation counsel with the law firm of Shook, Hardy and Bacon. He represents clients in a wide variety of high profile international and cross border disputes, including private investors and state sovereigns. Uh, he's litigated before the International Center for Settlement and Investment Disputes and UNCITRAL bodies in Washington, D.C., Paris, and the Peace Palace in The Hague. And he was recently appointed to the roster of international arbitrators at the AmCham Peru and was featured in 40 under 40 in international arbitration in 2021. So uh, welcome, uh, Ricardo, and uh, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Natalia, and uh, thank you to ASI and to Columbia University for inviting me to present here. Um, I will be uh, discussing uh, whether, you know, what, what kind of treaty protection there is right now uh, to foreign investors in Cuba. So I'll be uh, piggybacking a little bit on what uh, uh, Carl has already presented. And um, First, before I start, uh, I, I'd like to give you just a very quick crash course on uh, foreign investment treaties. There's approximately 3,000 um, investment protection treaties worldwide. Uh, they cover, they typically cover um, basic but pretty comprehensive uh, uh, measures of protection against uh, 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 conduct by foreign states, by host states. Uh, including, for example, uh, protection against uh, unlawful expropriation or protection against uh, unfair or inequitable treatment. Uh, and that can mean uh, a whole variety of uh, different things, uh, such as um, uh, unfair legislative changes, uh, breaches of contract in some situations, arbitrary treatment, uh, discriminatory treatment, um, and the list basically goes on. So basically, if uh, if an investor is, if a foreign investor is treated unfairly by the host state, then these treaties will provide uh, typically uh, protection against that sort of conduct. And what happens is after there is a breaching conduct uh, by, by, by the host state, then the investor has the option of initiating uh, international arbitration against the state uh, before a body that is uh, outlined in the treaty. Um, and that arbitration results in an award, which will then be enforceable, um, typically either through the New York Convention or the Exit Convention on the enforcement of uh, arbitral awards. Um, and that enforcement is typically available in about 160 member states. Uh, this is a good time also to uh, um, go through a little bit of the fine print. So in this presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, present to you the my findings as uh, an international arbitration practitioner about where Cuba is on the map in the uh, foreign investment uh, treaty world. Um, and that's going to be the focus of my presentation. Of course, my presentation is not going to cover uh, any restrictions or sanctions imposed by any country. Uh, and of course, none of this is any, should be construed as any legal advice and um, the views that I present here are exclusively my own. So when, when I started looking at Cuba and uh, uh, what, uh, what its investment protection framework is, I found the following, Cuba has 60 bilateral investment protection treaties or BITs signed. Uh, 40 of them are in force. Uh, one of them was terminated and there's approximately 19 that are, uh, actually 19, sorry, uh, 
that are signed but not in force uh, because they haven't been ratified. Uh, the treaties that Cuba has signed, uh, many of them include fair and equitable treatment clauses, which is a very typical clause to see in this kind of investment treaty. There's also expropriation clauses, and you can see uh, that uh, the treaties use UNCTRAL and ICC arbitration, which is also pretty common. Um, and Cuba has uh, signed these treaties with countries in Europe, North America, and South America. Uh, the list is here in the slide. So um, just uh, my impression when I was looking at this is that Cuba has, uh, uh, this is pretty standard to see across uh, in, 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 in countries of Cuba size, uh, you know, this number of treaties um, uh, being enforced. So this was pretty standard. Uh, 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 comparatively. And as an example in this slide, I look at some of the provisions of the Cuba Netherlands Treaty. Uh, it includes a fair and equitable treatment clause, which is uh, pretty useful for, uh, for international arbitration disputes. Um, this clause typically protects against arbitrary treatment, discrimination, lack of transparency, due process, and uh, failure to provide uh, justice or denial of justice. Um, and there, the, the, the treaty also has an expropriation clause. It calls it an unlawful deprivation clause, which uh, appears to be functionally the same. Um, and the treaty outlines the, the parameters under which that expropriation clause uh, works. Uh, it also has a dispute resolution clause with a six month cooling off period. Uh, it uh, allows the investors to submit the dispute to local courts, uh, ICC arbitration, onset trial, and uh, ICSID, which is a uh, part of the World Bank, uh, Bank uh, Group. However, uh, once I started looking a little bit more closely, I started seeing some issues that I, as, a, as an international arbitration practitioner, would be uh, concerned about. And if, uh, if I had a, a client uh, looking to make a foreign investment in Cuba, I would want to be careful to analyze these issues more closely. One of them, is that uh, Cuba is actually not a member of the exit convention. So even though its treaties make reference to the exit convention, there would be an open question as to whether the exit convention would even apply uh, or, or the, ex the exit arbitration would be even available as, a, as an avenue to bring a claim by a foreign investor. Um, also, uh, even though Cuba uh, uh, ratified the New York convention, uh, and uh, is a member of the New York Convention, the uh, Cuban government put a, uh, an important uh, reservation. It says that uh, it will apply the convention only to the differences, to differences arising out of legal relationships, whether contractual or not, which are considered as commercial under Cuban legislation. Now, uh, I should say that I am not a Cuban law attorney, so it'll be up to a Cuban law attorney to determine what exactly that means. But it is uh, a reservation that I would be concerned about and would want to find out more about. Now, there is also, I, I also came across a foreign investment law uh, um, that was enacted by Cuba uh, domestically. Um, and basically, Article 61 of the Foreign Investment Clause appears to say that uh, it is uh, that it, arbitration is not precluded uh, as a means of dispute resolution. Once again, I'm not a Cuban law attorney, so I wouldn't be able to say whether you know what what the significance of that is. But it it did catch my attention. Now. Uh, Afterwards, I started looking at some of the disputes at actually, and actually I tried to find out about all the disputes that uh, concerning foreign investment that Cuba was involved in. And here is the full list. Um, and uh, this is pretty short compared to other countries. Um, it's not completely unusual, but uh, so there's basically been uh, the, you know, the four disputes that you see here. Um, and one thing that the first thing that caught my attention is that there's very little that is known about the, these disputes. Uh, all of them were um, through before you know through ICC arbitration, 
And there is one, uh, the first one at the top that says of Salado de Cementos versus Cuba, uh, where you get a glimpse of, uh, if, and this is through reports uh, because the, the, the actual documents are not available, uh, but there are reports in the specialized press. And what you can see is that Cuba appears to have insisted or objected that the investor should have res resorted to Cuban tribunals to bring its dispute. So that seems to be uh, consistent with uh, my previous observations that, um, that it's possible that treaty arbitration and that, and that arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism is not uh, firmly available to foreign investors under the current framework. There was also, uh, oh, and you can see in, in, in the specialized press reports that uh, the, dis, the, the arbitrators that uh, uh, have decided these uh, foreign investment disputes have been some of the most uh, uh, recognized names in the field. Um, and you can see the list right here. Uh, there was another case that was pretty unusual, caught my attention. It was a state-to-state a, a, a -state case, but it was still concerning investors, and it occurred between Italy and Cuba. So basically what happened is that Italy made the unusual uh, uh, move to espouse uh, the claims of 16 different uh, corporate investors in Cuba. Uh, they operated in, uh, in, in a uh, variety of industries. Uh, the tribunal was composed of uh, Yves Daran, Attila Tanzi, and Narciso Kobarura. Uh, Yves Daran is, uh, is, is very famous in this circle. And, uh, you know, so, so, so you have a tribunal, um, you know, not unlike any other tribunals that you see in other investment disputes. Um, most of the claims in this case were abandoned. Uh, and, you know, but, but you can see in the press reports information about two of them. One is a, a claim by a beauty salon, uh, but the tribunal found that the claim failed because it found that Cuba uh, was, had enough grounds to revoke the uh, beauty salon's uh, license uh, because this, the, the, the salon was providing unlicensed uh, tattooing services. Uh, you can also see a claim by a, uh, uh, a health uh, company. And unfortunately, you cannot learn, see very much about why the dispute, uh, why Cuba prevailed and why the investor lost in, the, in this particular dispute. Um, basically, what you can see is that uh, um, uh, the tribunal found that the investor was at fault uh, that, that it caused its own confusion as to whether uh, its own uh, representatives could uh, replace a, uh, a prior investor in, the, in, in, in that arrangement. Uh, the investor was alleging that Cuba had prevented it from doing that, but, uh, but basically the tribunal said, you were the one, you know, you caused your own uh, troubles here. Um, and one of the questions that I, that I had for this is, uh, you know, what exactly was it that uh, the tribunal found that caused this confusion? Um, you know, there, was, there were many details that I wanted to find out about, uh, but unfortunately they're just not available. The, the documents, the primary documents are not available. So we have, uh, you have to rely on very uh, brief uh, press reports, even in the specialized press. So after having looked at all of this, uh, here are some conclusions that I that I you know that, that I took away from um, from looking at Cuba's situation here. Uh, Cuba is definitely not unfamiliar with uh, foreign investment uh, disputes. Uh, um, it has a uh, uh, um, you know four uh, investor state disputes under its belt and one state to state dispute. So uh, it. Uh, it probably has uh, institutional developed institutional knowledge um, about how these proceedings typically take place. Uh, and these disputes were before some very recognized uh, names in the field. Uh, and uh, here in the third point, 
you can see Cuba's performance. I mean, Cuba has basically prevailed in all of these disputes. Uh, so its performance is definitely higher than the global average for other states, which is typically around 50%. And uh, perhaps relatedly, uh, because Cuba is absent from the exit convention and also from uh, uh, the Panama Convention on Enforcement of Arbitral Awards, and because of its reservation in the uh, New York Convention, then uh, there are real issues and questions about whether an arbitral award against Cuba could be actually enforceable. It's something that should be explored more deeply on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so now for the policymakers, a couple of conclusions here. There is some room for a renegotiation of some of these treaties. Uh, um, for example, uh, some of the treaties that have been signed but not ratified, there could be uh, room to get that ball rolling. Uh, and in doing so, perhaps uh, treaty negotiators could look for common grounds uh, to facilitate an avenue for enforcement for uh, the Cuban, uh, 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 for arbitral awards involving Cuba. And finally, uh, just to reiterate uh, uh, Carl's point, um, something that should be important for foreign investors is to make sure that they that uh, at the moment of investment, at the moment of signing a contract, at the moment of establishing uh, the investment in Cuban territory, uh, that's when the foreign investor should uh, make sure that its decision and, and its investment is protected either through collateral or some other security or some other alternative strategy. And that is the moment where uh, the investor should conduct its own risk assessment before diving in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Can I ask all the panelists to come online now? Uh, this is the Q&A and uh, we have not enough time. I don't know if you can go over a few minutes, but um, I thought I'd start, if any of you are welcome to look at the Q&A uh, uh, list and see if there are questions that you wanna answer. Uh, there's one here, let me start with one. Bill Messina said to, wants to know from Jorge, when he says that we need massive infrastructure inve investment, uh, he wants to know who's gonna provide that. Sure, I, the, the Messina's question come from those infrastructure projects that have to financially survive as a result of uh, government subsidies. Um, what, what I want to point is that some of these infrastructure projects depend on the disposable income uh, of those that are going to receive the service. For, for example, electric power, uh, rail transportation. Uh, the companies that are going to invest in these projects have to receive an acceptable rate of return. And that acceptable rate of return comes as a result of the public ser service tariffs uh, that the consumers have to pay. Uh, so it goes back to what is it going to be the disposable income of the population in order to afford electricity, in order to afford, to afford good services of transportation. Uh, that is the key, is the Cuban middle class that's going to justify a lot of these public uh, service infrastructure projects. Um. Armando Perez asked if there was an existing legal institutional foundation to build on to facilitate FDI. I think we've all answered the question that it isn't there yet. Um, but what he wanted them to know is how long does it take? Carl maybe can tell us, <laughs> how long does it take for a country to attain a sufficient uh, framework to attract FDI? How, how, what's the time frame? Well, I mean, it's, uh, well, let me respond on, on, on two levels. Um, the first one is, I think that there is already quite some protection for foreign investors going into Cuba, given the bilateral investment treaties. So regardless of what the domestic framework is, they have protection and they have protection with practically well, not with all major uh, capital exporting countries, but with quite a number of countries. Now, as far as the domestic framework is concerned, um, it could be done very rapidly. No, I mean, it's a question of introducing an appropriate law. Cuba could easily obtain 
advice on how such a law should uh, look like, uh, not only from private law firms, but also from the World Bank or from UNCTAD. Um, and then it becomes a question, of course, of uh, passing it through the, uh, the institutions and most importantly to implement it. But to revise the law and to have a state of the art investment law as such is not a big issue per se. Does anybody want to add to that? Um, <clears throat> uh, Johannes Werner asked, what kind of guarantees would Cuba have to offer? Is Cuba's current 2017 FDI law an improvement or is it adequate? Maybe Pedro would like to answer that question. Yeah, I, I think the issue goes a little bit beyond what the uh, text of the law says. And, and in terms of guarantees, I go back to my comments, which is there has to be a philosophical shift in Cuba uh, away from this absolute commitment to state uh, centralized planning and control of the economy. Uh, it was interesting to note that in Diaz-Canel's uh, closing comments at the party Congress, he made a passing reference to Cuba needed to move more in the direction of China and Vietnam. Uh, I found that interesting. Whether that's going to actually happen or not is difficult to say because at the end of the day, Diaz-Canel is a consensual leader. So his ability to work is very constrained by the other uh, stakeholders and in, in keeping him there. But uh, sooner rather than later, uh, reality will impose itself on Cuba and the under the underlying the underpinnings of the economic and political structure will have to be changed in the direction of providing further guarantees. Okay, I have another question from I think it's I can't see the full name I think it's Janet Walsh and the question is um, it's critical to FDI to have not just legal structure of financial tax, but also HR infrastructure. Can you uh, respond to what kind of HR infrastructure Cuba has? And by the you know human resources, I think Cuba is uh, has a tremendous uh, uh, capacity in human resource. I mean, it's like a very, it's it's a it's really astounding how uh, both well-educated, how many well-educated and how many, and how entrepreneurial the culture is, which I think is really important to building an economy. People are very used to problem solving and to working it together. And I think they're also very, um, very sophisticated. That's, that's my impression dealing with Cuba over the last few years. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Pedro, you have been dealing in Jorge. I don't wanna hog the space, but my observation, as I mentioned, is that certainly my interlocutors were by and large, very competent, very smart, uh, all of that working in a very arid terrain. So once again, I go back to the terrain. It's, it's not the individual. Cuba's, Cuba's problem is not human capital. Cuba's problem is capital and the creation of capital and, and, and the ability to generate wealth, to create wealth. Um, that said, Cuba also has a system that is fundamentally ethically suspect of leasing employees. And we see that, for example, in the outsourcing of medical support personnel to other countries where Cuba receives hard currency and pays them in, in a minimal uh, a stipend. And that, that's something that has been challenged. It continues to be challenged uh, at all levels. So there needs to be that sort of underlying reform of the system in order to free up that human potential, but the capacity is there. And I think one of the evidences of that, of that is Cuba has been able to generate uh, COVID vaccines uh, because Cuba punches above its weight in biotechnology because of its human capital. Natalia, um, a couple other questions I just noticed here. Thank you. Um, 
the Marielle Development Zone. Uh, does anybody want to comment on how it's working? And uh, other than Nestle, what other major investors are there in the zone? And is it producing any hard currency for the country? Don't answer all at once. Jorge, I think that belongs to you. Yeah, if you look at the investments that we have looked at, uh, go back to Unilever and, and Nestle. Uh, they're small uh, investments, less than, uh, than $35, uh, $40 million um, in the production of uh, consumer products, uh, which again, I question what is the strategy of those two major uh, Fortune 100 international companies? What are they doing in Cuba? vis-a-vis uh, -vis when they're going to find the competition coming from uh, U.S. companies like Colgate, Palmolive, and so on. Uh, you have, for example, two small paint companies, uh, General Paint from Mexico and Total Paint from Spain, uh, mm -hmm. that have put together a, a plan to manufacture and blend uh, paint. Uh, Cuba's paint monopoly is owned by Vitrales. Uh, how is Vitrales and these two small companies uh, going to respond uh, the day that Sherwin Williams, which by the way, entered the Cuban market in 1929, uh, comes into the market as the opening of Cuba uh, eventually, hopefully will, will take place. So to me, when you look at the companies that are today operating in Mariel, they're small cap companies that are trying to take opportunity short term. Uh, they're entrepreneurial companies and they're looking for a short entry strategy because when Cuba opens up, uh, they'll have to, to face Porter Five Forces analysis. In other words, they're going to have to face uh, what the market uh, will give them. Okay. There was another question um, about Cuba's foreign investment law. Is it adequate? I think the answer to that is pretty clear. No, but somebody would want to comment on that. And um, Mary, yeah. if I may, there was another question that asked if, um, I think it was Mary Speck asked the question and said, is there support in Cuba for FDI? Um, and I, I, I invite other panelists to answer the question. I think there's certainly verbal support for FDI. They've made the point, they've made the, at the least at the recent party Congress, they again emphasize how much they want FDI. The question is, in my mind is, are they willing to make the changes that are necessary to attract it? Uh, go ahead, Pedro and Jorge and uh, Carl and Christina, whoever. No, one, one short comment. Uh, Pedro Freire, uh, your presentation going over <clears throat> the Cuban constitution, to be honest with you, uh, opened my eyes uh, structurally, structurally. Uh, the five, uh, four or five uh, articles that you outline in Cuba's constitution really puts a lot of question on long-term major capital, capital investment in Cuba. Uh, so thank you, Pedro, for at least waking me up as to the major obstacles that lie in Cuba's constitution that someday, somehow, I, I suppose will have to change. Beth, Carl, do you want to add anything? Well, um, as, as was pointed out during the webinar, Cuba is not a big market. So it's not necessarily that attractive uh, uh, for many companies, um, particularly if, if they have to choose to invest in Cuba versus Brazil or China or whatever. Um, and of course, there are uh, political obstacles. But my guess is um, that um, if Cuba makes a, a real effort to attract investment and considering the political constraints, including related to the embargo, it ought to be able to attract more than what it did in 2020, which according to the government was $2 billion. Um, as we said, the figures may not be that reliable as in many, in the case of many other countries, but, uh, you know, there seem to be major investments by Total and Siemens and, 
and uh, Asian companies. So I guess what is needed is really make a major effort to attract investors. And particular also, by the way, as, as, as was pointed out, because the human capital is there. And that's one of the big assets that attracts uh, investors. Yeah, I don't see, I, I don't see Cuba as, is not an important market for sale of consumer goods, but it has a lot of things going for it, like biotechnology, for example, information technology. I see opportunities to like enter into licensing agreements for selling technology and other intellectual property products that they produce, which they, they, they have the capability. That is one of their strengths. I, I would add to that that uh, sometimes uh, the end the, the, the end of the discussion is not uh, only on whether the domestic law on foreign investment is adequate, uh, because you can supplement if if there's if, if there's a country without a foreign investment law, for example, that can be supplemented by a robust and effective. Um, international treaty uh, structure uh, that the country has uh, 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 agreed to. Um, so, you know, if you have um, foreign investment treaties that provide adequate protection, and if you have uh, signed on to enforcement, international, international arbitration enforcement conventions that are effective in, in an effective manner where an arbitral award could be enforced, for example, I, as a foreign investor, that's something that would also give, in, it, in addition, or sometimes even in lieu of uh, a robust foreign investment law domestically, that kind of international framework is something that would also give me peace of mind as a, as a foreign investor. And as I, if I may just add a footnote to that, I mean, uh, Cuba has quite a number of bilateral investment treaties, so it has these protection in place. And if you could clarify one thing, uh, Ricardo, do bilateral investment treaties not also also co uh, cover contractual arrangements, management contracts, etc.? In other words, you don't have to put money into Cuba, even a management contract can be protected via bilateral yeah. investment treaties. Yes, uh, the, uh, of, of course, Carl, as you know, um, treaties can cover that. It, it will depend, there is slight variation across treaties as to what they cover. Um, and I know you and I were thinking about umbrella clauses and all of that. Uh, however, um, you know, in, 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 in Cuba's case, uh, there is some variation across treaties and you do see some of that. Uh, so it's important, it's, it's, it's really critical for the investor to at the moment of making a decision to really do their due diligence and look at uh, what these treaties cover. Now, in addition to that, what the foreign investor needs to do is whether if there's a dispute and if there is an arbitral award, What's going to happen with our arbitral award? Am I going to be able to enforce it? Good Where point. against what, what assets? You know, all of those questions need to be answered, as you know. We're now gone over um, the all allotted time. Uh, would anybody on the panel like to say anything else? Um, add anything? Um, Natalia, one quick question I think um, was answered already in written form, but I think would be interesting for people, uh, again, who haven't read the questions. And that is, is uh, Carl mentioned Cuba needs to participate in the WTO negotiations. Is it doing so? And the answer is um, no. Uh, <laughs> the negotiations, but I'm hesitant to a certain extent. The, uh, the discussions are formally based on a joint ministerial statement to which 104 of the 164 members of um, uh, the WTO have signed on to. But the negotiations are open to all countries, members of the WTO. Uh, so for instance, the US has not signed on to the joint ministerial statement, but it sits in the room and lists, doesn't intervene yet. 
uh, other, the same thing applies to other uh, members as well. So my guess is Cuba might be sitting in the room, but it is not a formal participant of the negotiations. And in order to become a formal participant to the negotiations, from what I understand, all you need to do is inform the chair, Chile, or the secretariat that indeed you sign on to the joint ministerial statement. Um, it wouldn't make much difference in terms of, it doesn't involve any obligations, but it just would signal that you're interested in this exercise. You can submit uh, uh, you know, proposals as to what should go into the, into the text. And that makes it important because at this stage, the negotiations are quite far advanced. As I mentioned, there is a consolidated text, the Easter text just came out. Um, you can still introduce ideas, uh, you know, for instance, to promote linkages or on transparency, you name it. So it would be important for Cuba to try to influence the process to the extent possible, because as you know, it's a consensus-based organization and you have to get everybody else on board. But since we are talking here about very technical measures, uh, as long as they are reasonable, it should be possible. The point is, if you're not at the table, you take the risk to be on the menu. So <laughs> well, I think that's a wonderful way to wrap up this conference. I wanted to thank all the panelists and then all of the people who've uh, tuned in. Uh, we really appreciate your interest and I really appreciate all the hard work everybody put into this and thank you. Thank you to ASCII and to uh, Columbia Cap Cap Capacity Building Project at Columbia Law School. And uh, we will be, we've recorded the, the webinar and we will be posting it on the ASCII website and on the website of Horizonte Cubano uh, in the next few days so that those who were not able to participate by Zoom or who are at timing problems will be able to, to, to then. And I'm That's sorry. Fine. If I might just add, Natalia, I wanted to thank you on behalf of ASCII for putting this, this webinar on. I don't think anybody here can appreciate just how difficult it has been to get all these great people together, um, bang heads and get them all together at one time. And you've been working on it for months and you've done an excellent job and you're a credit to ASCII as well as your own organization. So thank you very much. Thank you all, I appreciate your collaboration and your support. Thanks. I agree. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Bye-bye. Pleasure to be with everyone. Bye-bye.